Welcome to NTD News. I'm Tiffany Meyer. Here are today's top stories. President Trump is bringing nursing homes into the spotlight. He announced new action to help protect what he called a weak spot amid the CCV virus crisis. President Trump weighs in on the lockdown debate in Michigan. Its governor signing an executive order last night to extend measures till the end of May. Reports from the U.S. intelligence community reject the idea that the virus was genetically modified or man-made. But not everyone agrees. Officials are still investigating whether or not it came from a Wuhan lab. And a German lawmaker makes a case for reducing economic dependence on China. This comes as more Europeans grow wary of faulty medical supplies. President Trump addressing the problem of death from the virus in nursing homes. He announced new measures to protect America's vulnerable older population while declaring May as Older Americans Month. President Trump signed a proclamation Thursday declaring May to be Older Americans Month. I don't know if I'm in that category. I have a feeling I am, but I feel good. He announced measures to protect seniors from the CCP virus, including a panel to examine the problem of infections in nursing homes. He said FEMA will send additional shipments of personal protective equipment to all 15,400 Medicaid and Medicare-certified nursing homes. He also said states will receive extra funding to increase inspections at nursing homes to the sum of $81 million from the CARES Act. President Trump said nursing homes became a weak spot during the spread of the virus. Some nursing facilities report clusters of infections, with some recording dozens of deaths. We don't want it to happen, so we're checking that out very carefully and very uh, methodically. The president also said that testing data from nursing homes will be posted online according to a new rule. The rule also requires virus cases from these homes to be reported directly to the CDC. When asked about his upcoming trip to Arizona, President Trump said he had no problem wearing a mask. I'm going to have to look at the climate. I'd have no problem wearing a mask. The president said the fatality rate in the U.S. due to the pandemic is far below other hearted countries, such as Spain and Italy and the United Kingdom. Earlier estimates by the Coronavirus Task Force projected deaths of up to 100,000 to 240,000 Americans. The death toll in the U.S. has now surpassed 63,000 people. And Army leaders are defending their decision to bring nearly 1,000 senior West Point cadets back to campus for a graduation ceremony amid the crisis. They say protective measures are in place and there are other essential tasks to be done. Army leaders said on Thursday the decision to bring nearly 1,000 West Point cadets back to campus was necessary. Senior cadets are returning for a commencement ceremony. Lieutenant General Darrell Williams said certain tasks had to be done to prepare the cadets for joining the Army, including... It was a series of medical tasks, essential tasks, that can only be done at the United States Military Academy. The graduation ceremony is set for June 13th. President Trump announced earlier this month he would give a speech at West Point. Returning Military Academy cadets will be screened for the virus. We'll do it safely and for all the parents and cadets that are out there watching right now, we're going to take care of them. He said steps will be taken to ensure social distancing is maintained. That includes eating and living separately, and with 60 to 70 percent of cadets leaving in their own vehicles. Army Secretary Ryan McCarthy said the plans, in place for over a month, had been passed along. To the Secretary of Defense and then on to the White House. But the President had accepted the invitation to speak at the Academy back, I believe it was in February. The cadets left the Academy in early March, leaving their gear behind. They've been learning remotely since their spring break due to the pandemic. Essentially rejecting theories of a man-made origin, the U.S. intelligence community says it agrees the CCP virus was not genetically modified or man-made. NTD's Miguel Moreno has more on the update. On Thursday, the U.S. intelligence community said it agrees that the CCP virus was not man-made. The office did not explain how it came to that conclusion. And at a press conference, President Trump said he hadn't seen the statement, but did see evidence suggesting the virus came from the lab. Have you seen anything at this point that gives you a high degree of confidence that the Wuhan Institute of Virology was the origin of this virus? Yes, I have. Yes, I have. So the possibility that the virus leaked from the laboratory in Wuhan is still being looked into. Just yesterday, Pompeo said China still hasn't given the U.S. access to the lab. Hiding anything. Look, we still haven't gained access. The world hasn't gained access 
to the WIV, the Virology Institute there. We, we don't know precisely where this virus originated from. The intelligence community also said it's looking into whether the outbreak began through contact with infected animals. Miguel Moreno, NTD News. Michigan's governor signed an executive order on Thursday night extending the state's lockdown measures till the end of May. It comes despite armed protesters entering Michigan's Capitol building on Thursday, unhappy with the stay-at-home order. On Thursday night, Michigan's governor signed an executive order keeping bars, gyms, casinos and theaters closed through May 28. It's been criticized as being too strict. The president weighed in this morning and encouraged her to give a little and make a deal. But the governor has said the fight against the virus isn't over and reminded Michiganders that people are still dying. Her move comes despite protesters, some bearing arms, gathering at Michigan's Capitol building on Thursday to protest her stay-at-home order. It's one of the strictest in the country. Under most circumstances, people aren't allowed to visit other homes and the sale of all non-essential items is banned. It's time to let people go back to work. That's all there is to it. Michigan has seen over 1 million unemployment claims, but it's also seen over 40,000 virus cases, one of the worst hit states in the country. Inside the Capitol building on Thursday, the Republican-controlled House voted against extending the governor's state of emergency order for another 28 days. Instead, it voted to sue the governor for her handling of the outbreak. Georgia's decision to allow businesses like tattoo parlors and nail salons to reopen has drawn criticism from all corners. How will Georgians take precautions? Here's how one massage therapist is trying to do it safely. In a field like massage therapy, it can be tough to maintain social distancing. But from the waiting area to the massage room, they're trying to stay safe. Good hygiene, like washing hands, temperature scans, um, everything's getting clean between each person. Uh, so we're taking a lot of precautions. Business owner Dr. Gardner says they're doing their best, even requiring clients to answer questions about possible virus exposure. Before you sign your name in, in the sign-in form, I have you, we have you read this, and if there's a yes to any of this, then we'll tell you to go to your doctor and uh, reschedule your appointment for today. The clinic includes two parts, chiropractic and massage therapy. The chiropractic side remained open, while the massage therapy side closed for three weeks. But the lockdown still took a toll on the business. When we had to close the massage therapist down, when she couldn't work, it really hurt us quite a bit. Um, a lot of patients as well, they don't want to leave their home because of the virus, which is very understandable. Business has slowed, but since opening, Chandler says she's a bit busier than she thought. I really didn't expect a lot of people to call, but I did have more than I expected. With fewer chairs in the waiting room, temperature checks, and more cleaning than usual, they're ready to buckle down and get business going. Melina Weiskup, NTD News. An update from the IRS. Business owners who have their Paycheck Protection Program loans forgiven won't be eligible for certain tax deductions. The agency says expenses paid for with the loan won't be deductible. Under the PPP, small businesses won't have to repay the low-interest loans they received as long as the loan went to essential expenses, like workers' payroll. Usually, wages are deductible come tax time. Likewise, forgiven debt counts as taxable income. But under the virus relief law, PPP loan forgiveness is not counted as taxable income. The IRS says expenses forgiven by a PPP loan are not tax deductible in order to prevent a double tax benefit. And the Trump administration now has fewer than 10,000 troops in Afghanistan. That puts it ahead of schedule for withdrawing American troops from the country. The U.S. is ahead of schedule in withdrawing troops from Afghanistan, according to the peace deal it made with the Taliban. By mid-July, the U.S. pledged to reduce its total number of troops to 8,600. That's down from the total of 12 to 13,000 soldiers the U.S. had in Afghanistan earlier this year. But it could hit that goal in just a few weeks, which would be months ahead of the original deadline. One U.S. defense official says the pandemic has accelerated the schedule somewhat. Coming up, UK leaders say the Chinese Communist regime is using the global demand for personal protective equipment to bolster its image. Find out how when we return. How do we get to this point? 
Back in December, the coronavirus was already spreading in Wuhan, and the Chinese Communist Party was covering it up and punishing the whistleblowers who dared to report the truth. Their actions led to this pandemic, which now has us, in America, stuck in our homes and losing our jobs. To this very day, the Communist Party is still lying, making it more critical than ever for us to get honest reporting about China. The Epic Times is able to bring you the uncensored truth because we maintain a network of underground sources inside of China, hidden from the censors of the communist government. For instance, our investigative team has been contacting individual funeral homes, hospitals, and they've obtained leaked internal documents which show that China's official numbers are massively underreported by a factor of at least 10. If you're looking for an honest source of news that can keep you informed and safe, check out The Epic Times. Go to readepic.com and try your first month for just a single dollar and get real journalism delivered straight to your doorstep. A human rights activist is jailed in China while his mom is critically ill. She wanted to see him one last time but was denied. NTD's Juliet Song reports. Her lung cancer getting worse, breathing getting harder by the day. This mother in China wrote an open letter, hoping to see her son one last time. After I pass away, I hope people can help and pay more attention to my son. He's innocent. He's innocent. Her son Huang Qi is one of the most famous human rights activists in China. He founded China's first human rights news website. It's named after the 1989 Tiananmen Square massacre. Huang is active in exposing human rights abuses and government corruption. He also helped the families of those who died in the massacre seek compensation. Huang's efforts have earned him international accolades including two awards from Reporters Without Borders. Last year, Chinese authorities sentenced him to 12 years in prison on the charge of, quote, illegally providing state secrets abroad and leaking state secrets. Huang suffers from coronary artery disease and uremia, but the prison has denied him proper medical care. His 87-year-old mother fears for his health. In her letter, she wrote, he won't last long with these health conditions. Also, there is little hope he will be released. We probably won't ever see one another again. She hasn't seen him for three years. Activists close to Huang's mother said she can't go unless the authorities approve. She said she doesn't know if he's alive or dead. She hasn't received any information from him. She sent a letter but doesn't know if he's received it. Huang Qing hasn't called her. Usually you're allowed to call your family a month after being imprisoned. Huang spent almost half of the last two decades in jail for his activism. But his mother still supports his work. She holds placards that say, Son, mom believes you're innocent. She keeps demanding he be released. Two years ago, she set out to appeal for Huang in Beijing, but was stopped halfway by the police. She is now under house arrest and can't seek medical help. She wants to be treated in a hospital, but she said she can't because the hospital won't take her. She's gravely ill. Her legs are all bloated. She wants to visit Huang Qin because she's worried about his health. To this day, Huang's mother is closely watched by authorities, and she's not allowed visitors. She's over 80 years old, yet still authorities are monitoring her. This is inhumane. These people... We want to visit her, but she's worried we will be implicated and suppressed by the authorities. Huang's mom fears she can't last until the day she will finally get to see her son. In a video seeking help two years ago, she shed tears for her son, saying she just wants to see him one last time. <laughs> Europeans are increasingly wary of being at the mercy of China for medical supplies. A member of the German parliament makes a case for reducing economic dependence on China. British medical doctors are warning that hundreds of ventilators from China could kill virus patients. In a Thursday NBC report, the doctors said the machines are faulty and unsuitable. The pandemic has prompted many in Europe to reflect on how they got into this mess and for the EU to revisit its trade relationship with China. For some, it's important to understand how the regime works. I grew up in the communist part of Germany. 
So I know the rules of the game in communist systems very well. Since March, many European governments have struggled to buy medical equipment like masks and testing kits to fill up large gaps in their supply. And they often had to rely on China. It exports a quarter of the world's masks. Some of these Chinese-made products are faulty or unsuitable. In mid-April, a German company found 11 million masks they had bought from China were unusable. We have to ensure that we do not remain this dependent on China. Prices alone cannot regulate such a thing. Then we are walking into a trap. After China joined the World Trade Organization in 2001, it gradually established its domination of crucial supply chains, including medical goods and drugs. China now provides up to 90 percent of the world's active ingredients for antibiotics. Many are concerned about the leverage the CCP has on countries' healthcare systems. It would be the worst thing if China one day says, so, and if you don't do as we wish, we won't supply you anymore. We must not be naive and blind and ignore the dangers that are always associated with dealing with a dictatorship. Prompted by the crisis, many in Europe are seeing more clearly the risks that come with economic dependence on China. Two weeks ago, EU trade ministers agreed it was important to diversify Europe's production processes to reduce the reliance on individual countries of supply. In Europe, we will need to strive for a different kind of production and supply. That means self-sufficiency with essential goods, even if it's more expensive. But then we know what we've got. We cannot be blackmailed with it. We cannot get into an emergency situation. Some in Europe see the risks and downsides start to outweigh the economic opportunities from investing in China. Europe has reduced its share in manufacturing exports since integrating trade with China. European companies still face significant barriers in accessing the Chinese market. And many who are already there, like BMW, have seen only stagnating revenue growth. Analysts at the Mercator Institute for China Studies argue that China is just as dependent on Europe and that the EU should leverage its economic power in dealing with the CCP. Reporting by Christian Watchen, NTD News, Berlin. And in the UK, wariness towards the Chinese regime continues to mount. Some lawmakers are concerned the CCP is trying to bolster its image amid the pandemic. Our UK correspondent Jane Wirrell has more. The Chinese regime's handling of the pandemic has shown it plays by authoritarian rules. The chair of the UK's Defence Committee says it seems the Chinese state is trying to bolster its image after covering up the outbreak and concealing data. I'm now concerned that they're actually using the absolute global demand for personal protective equipment, which they produce um, in large numbers, uh, to create another equivalent of the one belt, one road, but a, but a health silk road. But the CCP's efforts to rebrand themselves amid the crisis hasn't always worked. Many European countries have complained about faulty Chinese-made equipment and wariness of the Chinese state is growing among many senior lawmakers. The West needs to be more determined in, in recognising what it stands for, what it believes in, what it defends. Everybody I think thought this might be the end of President Xi, but he's managed to turn this around to his own advantage. He's, he's illustrating as if he's tamed this virus. Uh, by producing these numbers, which simply don't add up. The EU's foreign policy chief has warned of a battle of narratives during the pandemic, saying China is aggressively pushing the message that, unlike the US, it is a responsible and reliable partner. The UK's Foreign Secretary Dominic Raab has said that it won't be business as usual with China after the crisis. Jane Wirrell, NTD News, London. Coming up, NTD UK takes a look at the reopening of Europe's largest car factory. While in France, the Human Rights Commission raises concerns over an app designed to track people who have the virus. Ninety percent of news outlets in the United States are controlled by six corporations. They're not out to tell you the truth of what's happening. They're out to tell you the picture of the world that they represent. The mission of the Epic Times is to chase the truth, to ground all statements and facts, and prevent people from being misled. This is a battle, a battle between truth and deceit. Subscribe today and join the Americans who are seeking truth and tradition. We'd love to have you on board.
Viewers have described China Uncensored like The Daily Show, but about China. Well, at the beginning, I was super excited when I got 500 views, and now the show's grown to about half a million subscribers on YouTube. One episode reached 7.9 million people. I'm a little freaked out that that many people have seen my face. In five years, I see China Uncensored as the sole source of edutainment worldwide. And now we bring you more news updates from the UK and Europe. Let's head over to London. Hello and welcome to NTT UK, bringing you UK and Euro news. I'm Neil Woodrow. In Europe's largest economy, German car makers are keen to get back to work. Volkswagen started up production at its biggest factory in Wolfsburg this week after putting new measures in place to protect its workforce. Germany eased lockdown rules this week, encouraged by a fall in infection rates. Around 8,000 workers started building cars again at Volkswagen's biggest factory in Wolfsburg, Germany, on Monday, each of them wearing a mask. Production capacity in the Wolfsburg plants will hover around 10 to 15 percent to start with, rising to around 40 percent of usual levels the following week. The German state of Lower Saxony controls 20% of VW's voting rights. The state governor said it's impossible to get back to normal production right away. If we want to try to get back to normality, bit by bit, it is not going to be possible by doing things exactly as we did them before the virus. Businesses that don't comply with the new face mask regulations may incur heavy fines of up to 5,000 euros or 5,400 US dollars. The Volkswagen Group is also restarting production in plants across Europe, South Africa and South America this week. Its plans mirror French rivals Renault, Peugeot and Fiat Chrysler. But inventory levels across the car industry are piling up due to falling demand amid the pandemic. This comes on top of growing concerns in the EU that China's state-subsidised manufacturers are distorting global competition. 45% of the EU's exports come from aircraft, trains, chemicals, pharmaceuticals and cars. In France, mobile phone software designed to track the spread of the virus is raising concerns among lawmakers and civil liberty groups. They say the contact tracing app links to serious issues about state surveillance and privacy. France postponed its parliamentary debate on a virus contact tracing app called Stop Covid on Tuesday. French Prime Minister Edouard Philippe said the debate would be premature at this stage due to uncertainty around this application. He reaffirmed his pledge that before the app is released, French lawmakers will have a debate followed by a vote. He said in the meantime, engineers will continue to develop the app. Philippe said a large number of political leaders from all parties have raised concerns about the app. Their concerns centre on civil and individual liberties. One of the developers working on the app says it will not rely on geolocation, a feature that reveals your location when using the internet or a mobile phone. All apps being developed, or almost all, relies on this protocol of low-energy Bluetooth. However, we do not use geolocation at all. But the French app will use a centralised server. A group of French IT specialists published an open letter on Sunday warning of the potential for the app to lead to mass surveillance. And the president of the National Consultative Commission for Human Rights, CNCDH, said on Monday that the app was dangerous for human rights. The French government says it intends for the app to be used on a voluntary basis. But the CNCDH president questions how this would work. Is this voluntarism free of choice? I'm not sure of that. For example, an employer could just say, Sir, you do not have the app. I can't allow you to go back to work. He said that once the app is installed on people's phones, it could be turned to other uses. For example, to track migrants, to track delinquent citizens, to track citizens not in accordance with the rules of this or that legal situation. Meaning that the app could be utilised beyond the pandemic. Here in the UK, Boris Johnson's government is eager to introduce a similar app, alongside 18,000 contact traces. But one important factor for its success will be whether enough people download and use the app. They are aiming to roll it out in mid-May. University of Oxford researchers told the New Scientist magazine that 80% of smartphone users would need to install the app for it to be effective in suppressing an epidemic. That's just over half the UK population. Patrick Valence, the UK's chief scientific officer, said that that would be a tall order. 
The magazine said other potential issues may be caused by the way people hold their phones and unreliable data. They also said that Bluetooth range penetrating walls can result in false positives. We will bring you more developments on this evolving story. A World War II veteran, Captain Tom is now an honorary colonel and a national hero after raising over $37 million for the National Health Service and those who are on the front line against the CCP virus. Celebrating his 100th birthday with a Spitfire flypast, UK Prime Minister Boris Johnson said at yesterday's virus briefing, he is a point of light in all our lives. We salute you, Colonel Tom. That's all from us till next time. Goodbye. Coming up, a scarf a day keeps the nation informed. Dr. Deborah Burks has become a pop culture phenomenon. Find out more when we return. The daily White House press briefings are making waves in the fashion community and turning Dr. Burks into a pop culture commodity. Dr. Deborah Burks is getting noticed for her scarf collection. One Texas woman made an Instagram account with the name at Deborah Burks Scarfs, and it's really taking off. It's amazing to see so many people, not just, it's, it's a combination of people that admire Dr. Burks and also like scarves. And, um, and so it's kind of created its own little community, um, which has been really fun and something I absolutely didn't expect. Now fans are posting their own photos inspired by Dr. Burks. A top fashion critic says the doctor stands out. She isn't wearing the typical Washington jewel tones or a suit. Her style was a lot, to me, is less about power and it's more about cajoling and reassuring. And I think she has been called upon to do both of those things in her position. The Ad Deborah Burke Scarfs account has over 30,000 followers now. Its creator says she's happy people can see beyond the fashion. The majority of people on that account recognize that it's more than just scarves. Um, and so the comments that come where, you know, she's a great role model for young women or those kinds of comments are always the ones that, that bring me so much life. She says she hopes the account gives people a break from dealing with nonstop virus coverage. If you have to wear a mask in public, why not do it in style? Disney is offering some fun options. Disney is introducing non-medical face masks featuring some of its most popular characters, including Mickey and Minnie Mouse, Anna and Elsa, Woody and Buzz Lightyear, The Avengers, R2-D2, and The Mandalorian, character people call Baby Yoda. They cost $19.99 for a four-pack and are available for pre-sale at the Shop Disney website. Disney is donating all profits from U.S. sales of the masks up to a million dollars to the nonprofit group MedShare until September 30th. Disney is also donating a million of the masks for kids and families in underserved and vulnerable communities across the United States. And that's all for now. Thanks for tuning in. Catch up again at 6.30 p.m. Eastern Time. I'm Tiffany Meyer.